I know that the consensus right now seems to be that the Magic will be selecting Jabari Smith with the number one pick, but this is my mock draft and I would not be surprised if Orlando went for Chet Holmgren. The 7 footer had an excellent freshman year for Gonzaga and is number one on my personal big board. Chet can dominate the rim on both ends of the floor with his shot blocking and then elite finishing, about 81% at the rim. He can space out to the three-point line and knock down his outside shots, and he can even pass and handle. Holmgren will be switchable on defense, and even though the concerns about his frame and lack of strength exist, I am not overly worried about them because mainly of how tough he plays. On top of that, Jeff Weltman, Orlando's president of basketball operations, has a track record of loving rangy, long, versatile prospects, and Holmgren is the ultimate one. Now, Jabari Smith is a possibility here. The Magic shot a dismal 33% from three last season, and he would be able to help out with that, but I think Chet overall just takes the cake for me. He's better than Mo Bamba, so there's no need to worry about that there, and he should definitely be able to play with Wendell Carter Jr., who in my eyes is Orlando's real long-term frontcourt fixture. The Oklahoma City Thunder were the worst three-point shooting team in the league this past season. They badly need help in that department, and that is where Jabari Smith comes in at number two. Smith is by far the best scorer in his draft class, and he could even prove to be a generational talent when it comes to putting the ball in the hoop. I'll break down Jabari more at length in my scouting report video coming out soon, but he can really struggle to create separation and to some extent he can struggle to create his own offense at times. But at OKC with Josh Giddy and Shea Gilgis Alexander, there is less of an emphasis on Jabari to create his own looks. He would also have point guards in Orlando, don't get me wrong, Jalen Suggs, Markel Fultz, Cole Anthony, but I think there's more questions about any of them than the OKC guards. If I was a Thunder fan and I got Jabari Smith at number two, I would be very excited. With the third pick in this year's NBA draft, the Rockets go with Duke forward Paulo Bancaro. Now, this is really the one lock that I have, especially early in the draft. Houston should be ecstatic to see Bancaro quote unquote fall to them. The Italian forward's three dimensional scoring game fits very nicely next to Kevin Porter Jr. and Jalen Green. Both of them can also score at a high level, but they should also serve as more traditional facilitators. Now, I've broken down Bancaro at length before, so I won't get into it as much here, but I do have more questions about his defense than his offense. Mainly, who he guards, whether he can switch, and who you put him next to in order to conceal some of those flaws. But as of right now, I'm not sure that Houston is too worried about being that good in the short term, so really, they should just draft Bancaro, who I believe is a future all-star talent, and then cross those bridges when the time comes. Number four is where I think things will start getting crazy in this draft, so I'm gonna go with Dyson Daniels to Sacramento. I would not bet money on this happening in real life, so to speak, but I love this fit with De'Aaron Fox and Domantas Sabonis. Also, I wouldn't be totally blown away if this did materialize, given all the buzz about Daniels' stock rising. Now, it's draft season, so we do have to take rumors with a grain of salt, but the Australian point guard projects as another success story coming out of Down Under and the G League Ignite pipeline. For Kings fans with concerns, Daniels can be a connector figure, similar to Tyrese Halliburton. He's long, a creative passer, and I like him more now than where Halliburton was as a multi-positional defender. Daniels' shot does not look great, he shot about 25% from 3 in his sole season in the G League, but his floater game is already cash money for me, the form on the jumper overall is not busted, and his volume from 3 is historically good. If anything, I expect Daniels to at least be a solid enough spot up shooter. Now this is a high pick to take Dyson, but I'd be more than comfortable doing it because I like him so much. Jaden Ivey falls to number 5 because of where Daniels went, but I doubt Detroit fans will care too much. I'm very interested in seeing where the Pistons go from here as a franchise. Kate Cunningham had an up and down rookie year, but I thought his flashes of brilliance were evident, and especially towards the second half of the season. I enjoy Ivy's fit with Cunningham in Motown. I remain unconvinced that the Purdue product is a natural point guard, so I much rather prefer slotting him next to a bigger playmaking wing, such as Cade. Ivy's context in college basketball makes me think that he should thrive as more of a combo guard in the NBA rather than a pure point. He's not the best facilitator or decision maker, 
so you want Ivy not thinking too much with the ball in his hands and really just getting downhill to attack. Ivy is an aggressive all around threat there and be it in the half court or especially in transition. He's not the same type of player but I do see some shades of Russell Westbrook and Tyrese Maxey. However, Ivy is not as good of a passer as Westbrook and he does not have the same mid-range game that Maxey possesses. Questions also exist about Ivy's 3-pointer which I will address when my longer video about him comes out. But overall, I think he instantly becomes the best athlete in Detroit and he should be a great fit in the team's new core. At number 6, some people will say Keegan Murray is the best player available here. Others will say he's not, but either way I think Murray is a stud who is still early in his development curve despite being a bit older. The Iowa standout will turn 22 in August, but his game is so well rounded that I have very few concerns about his age. Like I mentioned in my scouting video, Murray started playing at a high level of competition much later. So to quickly dispel this, Murray is not one dimensional and he is not a flat track bully just doing it against weaker opposition. Murray is lethal in transition and can really bring the ball up off opponent misses. We saw him do this all season to great effect. The former Hawkeye is also a good outside shooter at about 40% from 3 on the year. His real percentage might be more around that 37%-ish mark but I'm comfortable with that either way. On top of that, Murray can also attack mismatches in the post and he's at ease facing up and going to town from there. Positionally speaking, Murray is more of a 4-5 hybrid rather than a 3-4 hybrid, but I'm okay with it, especially on defense where he has enough pop protecting the rim from the help side. Murray's not super switchy, but I think he'll be okay in the right conservative scheme, despite probably never becoming a plus-plus defender. This is on the lower end of outcome for Shade and Sharp, but Portland, I think, would be thrilled to get him at 7, that is, if they keep this pick. The Canadian wing did not play a single second of college basketball after enrolling at Kentucky. He also did not suit up at the NBA Draft Combine and has largely been kept under wraps which has led to some criticism of Sharp. Again, grain of salt and all that, but I do think it's possible for Sharp to slide past his original projected top 5 slot. But if the question is whether he's a top 5 talent, the answer could very well be yes. I'm very high on Sharp. He measured a bit smaller than I thought at about 6'5", but he's got a near 7 foot wingspan and is a very good athlete. Also, we're still a bit away from this, but Sharp has shown enough flashes to me of being a self-sufficient scorer who can create for himself, while still looking like a two-way player down the other end. As for Portland, they like to gamble on unproven athletic guys in unconventional or unfavorable contexts. Anthony Simons and Keon Johnson come to mind recently, so I would not be surprised to see them take Sharp off the board if he's still there. The Pelicans are on the rise, and at number 8 I have New Orleans going for AJ Griffin. Griffin is also a guy Portland could prioritize at 7 if they keep their pick and want to add some wing shooting to complement the returning Damian Lillard, but I think AJG makes too much sense for New Orleans, especially considering that Zion Williamson is also going to be coming back. I still have some questions about Griffin, namely whether his current athleticism is sort of where he's at or if he still has some work to do on building up his body post injuries. I don't think it's totally out of the picture for a team to redshirt Griffin in his first year in the league. Either way, he projects as a very good outside shooter who's shown enough flashes creating for himself and attacking a closeout. Even if that's his ceiling, that's already a very valuable player in a playoff situation. But if the Pels can develop Griffin into something even more, that's scary to think about with Zion and then Brandon Ingram also on the wing. I have a feeling that San Antonio fans will be happy with this pick, if not downright ecstatic, Jalen Duran at number 9 to the Spurs. Simply put, I think the Memphis Big is a top 5 talent in this class. Before the draft lottery, I thought there were scenarios where it made sense to potentially pick him top 3 or 4 in my opinion, so this is lower than my personal opinion of Jalen Duren. He's not the most multi-dimensional guy on offense right now, but he knows his role as a play finisher. Duren has also flashed some clever passing, although he still has to make better reads more consistently and an elbow jumper. So I think he will make some improvements offensively over time, especially when we take into account that he is the youngest player in this draft class. Where I like Duran the most right now is defensively. The Spurs are in need of some front court reinforcements and Duran is a perfect fit for them. And it's not just that. I'm confident that under San Antonio's tutelage, Duran could develop into an all-star, sort of in the DeAndre Ayton mold. 
I've seen some predictions about DC going with someone like Jeremy Sohan or another wing here, but I'm not sure that makes too much sense given that the Wizards already have Kyle Kuzma, Denny Avdia, and Rui Hachimura among others on their roster. That's why instead, I've gone for Johnny Davis here, who is a logical choice for Washington regardless of Bradley Beal's future in the capital. Davis has some question marks about him, primarily the drop in efficiency over the second half of the season, as well as whether he can space the floor well enough and what his actual role in the NBA is. To be honest though, I think those concerns are overblown. Wisconsin needed so much from Davis at times, and there was also an ankle injury around March. I also believe that Davis will be okay from 3, the mid-range is his forte and preferred shot right now, but I haven't seen too much that makes me think he will be below average from the 3 point line in the league. Finally, his NBA role should be more streamlined than at Wisco where he was asked to do everything, so in the short term, I expect Davis to be challenged with defending the other team's best guard, and then keeping it as simple as possible on offense without such a need to create for himself. If Ben Matherin is available at 11, I expect the Knicks to snag him up. New York likes Matherin, and I like this fit too. The Knicks are in a bit of an odd predicament where they still have to build through the draft kind of, but also have an established core group of guys it seems that they want to move forward with. Throughout this draft cycle, I've been on a few podcasts, and in all of them we've talked about the Knicks needing someone to get both feet in the paint and put pressure on the rim. Now, I'm not sure Matherin is necessarily this guy, at least not from a guard perspective, but I think he does add some things to the table that the Knicks do not necessarily have in abundance. The first is that he's a very good, explosive, above the rim type of athlete who can get buckets in transition, cutting, and slashing. The Knicks have guys who can catch lobs, but really that's Mitchell Robinson, Obi Toppin, and Jericho Sims if he plays. Extending to the outside, Matherin is also a pretty good shooter on very high volume. The Canadian wing's percentages were down to around 37% as a sophomore, but he was Arizona's number one option, and he was taking plenty of tough looks, including off of movement. OKC can afford to take a swing here at number 12, so I have the Thunder opting for French wing, Usman Jang. Jang is another example of how playing in the Australian NBL can really propel you up draft boards. Like I mentioned in my most recent video about the Frenchman, Jang had a very slow start to his season in New Zealand, but he turned it up big time to close off his year there. I do think his NBA success depends a lot on role. If Jang is used as a spot-up wing defender type, then that's really not his strong suit at all. But if you give him the ball, let him make plays, and create offense for himself and others, then OKC might have yet another very long ball handler, at about 6'10", who has honestly shown flashes of just about everything. Obviously, Jang's shooting will need to keep improving, and there could be plenty of G League reps in his future, but he's shown enough to keep me intrigued and interested. Jeng shines as a facilitator who can pass over the top of defenses and get creative with his passing angles. If his development goes right, then Jeng also projects as a multi-positional defender, even if he is not the quickest or most athletic. As I said, this is a bit of a gamble, but again, one that I would be very at ease with if I was OKC. Full disclaimer, I would not take Mark Williams at 13, even though I am a fan of his, but I would also not be furious at Charlotte doing this. The Hornets need an upgrade at the center position, and I think Williams can be that guy. He is built like a comic book basketball character at 7'2", with a 9'9 standing reach and explosive athleticism. There are a couple catches though. The first is that Williams' role on offense is always going to be very, very simple. He does not possess the ball skill of a Chet Holmgren or even like a Walker Kessler, but Williams can be ultra productive catching lobs, running the floor hard, and finishing at the rim. All of that is ideal next to LaMelo Ball who has not really played with this type of big since his days at Spire with current Pacers big Isaiah Jackson. On defense, I think Williams will be okay. He's switchy enough, you don't want him on the perimeter versus guards every time, or he'll eventually get cooked, but you can live with it once in a while. Where I really like him is around the rim, dropping. Williams can block shots with either hands, and he can absolutely patrol the paint. I like him dropping better, but once in a while he can come up high, defend in space a bit, and make himself a nuisance. However, I do think that this probably takes the Duke Center at least a couple years to figure out. So given what he has right now, and how long it might take for him to become, you know, truly a good defender, I'm not sure that's enough to make Williams a lottery pick. Either way, Charlotte will also have the chance to snag him up at 15. 
The 14th pick was one of the tougher ones for me because personally I think what Cleveland could use is another sort of secondary or tertiary guard that can also create their own shot. There's a few guys like this, but I think this is where Malachi Branham comes in. Branham is a bit of an unexpected one and done, but he's interesting and young enough to the point where he could be this year's Josh Primo. The Ohio State freshman just turned 19 in May. What we have in Branham, I think, is a guy who flashed NBA tools but still needs some help putting them together. The main thing that pops out right now is his reliance on the mid-range. Branham could well be a 3-level scorer down the line, but his shot diet will likely have to change. I'll have a longer video out on him, but the long story short here is that nearly half his shots were 2-point jumpers. To be fair, Branham made these at a 43% clip while creating most of these looks himself, which I love to see, but I want to see that extend to the 3-point line. There, much like at the rim, Branham was very efficient, but the difference is that unlike his makes at the basket, he was a lot more dependent on others to get him looks from deep. Really though, that's more than fine by me. I want whoever Cleveland drafts to know that he will have to defer to Darius Garland and Evan Mobley long term. Right now, Branham's game seems perfectly suited for that, but I think the real appeal comes is if you can talk yourself into him becoming a 3-level scorer down the line.